Hello and welcome to the Jackson Lean in Under 10 Minutes podcast, a podcast designed to bring you maximum information in under 10 minutes so you can get on your way to being jacked and lean. But today we're going to flip the script on that just a little bit because I have my buddy here, Sam Elsner, who's an amazing sports performance coach. And we're going to be talking to you on the concept of ecological dynamics in training. We'll break that down for you in a second here. And basically how to apply things like variability into your training so you can become a more robust human. So without further ado... Let's get into it. Sam, why don't you just kind of break down like your, your background on everything, man? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been a sports performance coach for almost coming up on 10 years now, which is crazy to think I'm coming yeah. up on being 28, started when I was 18, but I've always had that curiosity aspect since high school on like how to transfer the training, like how my training transfers to sport and all that. But uh, I was sports performance coach at a college last year. I'm currently at a online virtual personal training company called future right now which i've been almost a year now was at the university of minnesota as an intern sports science and athletic performance Sweet. intern head development coach at a volleyball club sports science director at a baseball club and all that stuff so i've had a pretty wealthy experience and coaching career so far yeah that's awesome dude yeah, yeah sam and i used to work together back at uh lifetime right yeah it's yeah. uh it was a small stint. I think uh, <laughs> I think you showed up like a month before I ducked out. But like, uh -huh. yeah, no, that's kind of where it uh, started. That was about like five years ago, which is crazy uh -huh. to think. But yeah, it was nerd at first sight, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, hundred percent. We just—I remember the first thing we talked about was just like a lot of just training shit right off the bat, yeah. and then a bunch of ebooks were exchanged. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, and seriously, then you, then you went on your way. It literally was like. Oh my gosh, nerd, 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 nerd. Hey, talk about this, talk about that. And then just, hey, yep. I got this ebook. You have this ebook. And just kind of uh, like yeah. switch it up that way. Yep. Classic, like, bro moment kind of thing. Bro moment. In a nerd sense. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's why I'm excited to have you on today, man. Just chatting more about ecological dynamics, mm -hmm. right? And so, why don't you break down what that concept is? Because that's going to form the basis of everything we're talking yeah, about today. Absolutely. Well, like, the concept of ecological dynamics is just. Um, how behaviors of our neurological, neurobiological systems within an environment, how they interact with one another, basically. Mm -hmm. All that being said is how individuals or organisms within an environment, let's say you and I, for example, we're communicating with one another. Mm -hmm. Well, if you go out into the world, like how animals and plants interact with one another. So looking at that aspect and how everything interacts and... Where I learned this theory was from my mentors at Emergence, who are great people, Sean Mishka and Tyler Yerby. Uh, I recommend go check them out and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But this, when I encountered this theory, it really opened up my eyes and really answered the question that I've always been asking myself, like, how do I make the transfer training more efficient? And mm -hmm. I've asked myself that since high school, college, as a collegiate athlete myself, I want it in track and field, which is a results-based sport, it really like answered that, and unfortunately it was after my career was done, but uh, it, it has taught me how to expand upon the linearity or the very set in stone type of thinking that a lot of coaches nowadays have, and it brings creativity, brings exploration, and it brings a lot more fun to training, which transfers more towards their mm -hmm. sport and performance on the field, court, whatever, mm -hmm. even bodybuilding, powerlifting, all that stuff. So you're, you're, you're basically saying that like with a lot of traditional training, it doesn't take into account the ability for on the field application, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of the training that you look out there, like linear periodization, block periodization, they don't take into account outside factors in, in life. Mm -hmm. and um, a lot of coaches think, oh, I'm in the weight room. This is what transfers directly from point A to point B. But you have your sleep quality, your nutritional habits, financial stress. If you're a collegiate athlete, you have academic stress. All right. of that, all of these compile and how you interact with one of those, your environment, whether you're in Minnesota versus like Texas, like if you're an outdoor sport like track and field, mm -hmm. like it matters what environment you're in, what situation you're in, you're could your journey so far and how you interact with that plays a major role in how you perform and what type of decisions you make 
in performance. And that can apply to more than just athletics yes, too, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It, can, it right. applies to people going out for a hike, people rock climbing, people bodybuilding, powerlifting, all that, just going for a general walk down the block because mm -hmm. when you look at it, the landscape changes and it's not a flat surface unless you believe that you're a flat earther. <laughs> uh, if we want to go down that route. That's a whole other can of worms we're not going to open up here. That's a whole, if, you th if you think everything is just linear and going down and it's the same step, same right. landscape every time, well, that's not the case. If mm -hmm. you go literally walk down your street, it bends, it curves, there might be potholes, there might be divots. Right. It's ever-changing, and that's, that's ecological dynamics and how you interpret how you interact with your environment mm -hmm. so that can be applied to anything so dude i i absolutely love that and and like i've actually been applying apply this a lot with my clients lately and it's just the mm -hmm. same concept like you know i'm a dad now i was out rolling fucking snowmen out the other day with my kid you know yeah. and like if i'm in the gym and i'm only doing things in you know a sagittal plane yeah and i have to go roll a ball a snowball and I have to turn and i'm not strong there i'm gonna get hurt right yeah exactly and when you look at ecological dynamics or you're looking at this concept called wayfinding mm -hmm. it's i look at it as there's a task that needs to be accomplished your brain is going to self-organize the body in a way that's going to make you accomplish that task. So for you saying, hey, I'm rolling a snowball to make a snowman, your body's, your brain's going to tell your body however way to do that to accomplish that task. Well, take that into account with like sports performance. Like mm -hmm. I, I tell people this, like if you play video games, play Madden, run the same play 10 times in a row, you're going to get a different outcome because you make certain decisions based off of what quote unquote affordances or opportunities there are for you. So that's kind of, that ties right. into a lot of other things. That's a, another avenue we can dive down, but that's just a, another concept we can think about. I really like that. And you know, you're talking in the context of sport or in life, there's yeah. other, it's not just your environments, but the people around you, the decisions they're making, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and you, if you look at like hiking or walking, if you come across like a pothole in the road, are you going to step in it? Probably not. You're going to step over it or how you step over it or avoid that pothole is going to be different in some way, shape, or form from person to person. Mm -hmm. Some people might hop over it. Some people might go around it. They might step this way, that way, that way, or something mm -hmm. like that. And so, and wayfinding is the concept of like coaching that, right? Yeah, or helping uh, people find their way in navigate that environment, yeah, right? Wayfinding is the person in their environment and coming up with self-regulated decisions. Mm -hmm. Way guiding or being a more guide way shower way shower yeah, yeah is what the coach's role should be instead of the coach being a utilitarian drill sergeant like hey this is how it should be done it should be guided uh instruction and be like hey i want you to accomplish this task but in how you accomplish that task is completely up to you right I no, I, I I really like that because I think you know think back to like my old sports or even like mm -hmm. a traditional bodybuilding program. They tell you what to do, exactly how to execute it. I want your elbow riding like this, and I think mm -hmm. there are some natural constraints that these affordances have, right? Mm -hmm. Like you know, typically a, a lat works in a certain path. Yeah. Yep. However, I need ultimately based on my structure yep. and the you know affordances of the equipment I have at my disposal exactly. to construct and find the pattern that targets that muscle properly, yeah, right? Exactly. And you touched on constraints, which is actually another theory or an approach that coaches can apply. It's called the constraints led approach. It takes into account the athlete or the individual, the environment there and, and other subtleties or physical attributes that play into their environment. Let's say your machines, your dumbbells the turf that you're on whatever equipment that you have or what environment or whatever you have at your disposal you can manipulate those three constraints in some way environment's really hard sometimes because you don't have that control right. button. navigate you know not not nitty-gritty details of like programming that but yeah. just in general like how do you construct sessions and goals and whatnot to accomplish so that? if i'm looking at an athlete sense and work in that athlete perspective and I'm working on the on field work and mm -hmm. I really dive into the deep of like what does an athlete perceive in his or her sport let's say for a football example and you're going to take a running back and I want that running back to really get good at navigating through traffic or in in a very congested space well I may just be like okay you have to get from this side of the line to the, that side of the line however way you do that between 
bodies, 10 bodies, you find that. Mm -hmm. And they may bump around. They get to navigate or explore different opportunities or affordances mm -hmm. in that landscape. If I'm going to work in a more hypertrophy setting and I have a client who, a couple clients who want that, get bigger, get stronger, mm -hmm. I'm going to run like, like for me, I love using Jig Tour's hypertrophy cluster model, which is like break things down into more sets instead of four by 10, go eight by five, mm -hmm. stuff like that. What I do is, okay, we want to work on the squat. You aren't the greatest at a squat. What I want you to do is eight sets of five, but each set you get to play around with different variations where that is your decision to make whichever one feels the most comfortable. I may tell you as that guide, be like, I want you to find a squat pattern that feels comfortable for you. Then we can build off of that in the future. So they may do a zercher squat. They may do a front squat, back squat. They may have their hands wide, whatever stance. You could play around with different variations. Mm -hmm. And until they accomplish that task of, hey, I found this squat variation that feels comfortable for me. Or this, and they might say, they naturally will say, this one sucked. I did not like this one. Keep that in the back of your head because you may want to train that. And as a coach, how much detail are we giving them as far as like being a way shower or a guide? Like, I want you to do a squat because it's a squat pattern. Great. Yeah. Now, what about I want it to be, you know, a squat pattern and I want you to feel it predominantly in your quads, which we know based on literature we're going to primarily, yeah. right? But like, how much detail are you giving before it becomes too much? So you're over that's, training them? that's usually when you read a lot of the literature, they say too much information is bad for an individual to think about. Mm -hmm. And so, at, and you got to take that with a grain of salt with, as the way show or guide or coach in this aspect, I'm going to say that as coach, it's, that's my perspective of a coach. You got to, you want to have a task or you have a goal in mind that you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. Let's say, for example, you want to feel it more in the quads. I want, I'm going to tell the athlete or guide them, be like, hey, I want you to play around with a variation of a front squat, whether that be stance, hand position, until you feel that you feel the most activity in your quads or you really feel it. They're going to play around with uh, certain warm-up sets. I usually imply it in my warm-up sets, like a set of 10, set of 5. Every, set, every rep needs to be different until you find that. Then we attack our main mm -hmm. rep scheme and you play around with that. You use that um, variation for that. So that can be applied into bodybuilding who are more specific on feel. What If you're feeling this muscle, trying to obviously gain size and like right. definition all of that, like play around with each rep to find, oh, this variation. And even if it's a tricep pushdown, like with a rope, they might feel like, oh, my hands are not even, but I feel this the most in both my triceps. Mm -hmm. Well, we've all been told, hey, you got to have them unison. You got to move like this. Or it, and it doesn't matter if that's, this is the universal way, but if it's not accomplishing the task of you don't feel that, right? I throw that out the window. I was like, if this is natural for you and you feel it, go ahead, run with it. Right. Yeah. I mean, and I, I, there's a lot of things coming to my head just hearing you talk and think about that. But like, you know, you know, uh, Paralympic athletes, mm -hmm. right? Like, I mean, they may have one leg shorter than another oh, or no at, leg at all, right? Oh, so like absolutely. you to say you have to do a bilateral squat with this positioning, right? Mm -hmm. They can't do that. Yeah. They so make you, it work. Yeah, they make it work. And that's actually a good point. I haven't had the opportunity to work with Paralympic athletes or those with any type of ailments. But like, yeah, they have to come up with even more explorative mm -hmm. movements or variations in order for them to complete said task. I worked with a uh, Paralympic basketball player. She was a wheelchair basketball player and she went to the Olympics and it was awesome watching her like navigate mm -hmm. the weight room. Yeah. And like I, there's only so much, you know, like I hear the patterns I know we want to hit kind of to yeah. your point about like was trying to squat, right? Like I know you need to do some sort of press. We need some upper back work because you're here all the time, right? And we had to find kind of what felt best for her and she could activate because her stability was all off because she couldn't use her legs, yeah. right? Like all kinds of different stuff. So I, I, I like this concept and application to a variety of different athletes. And I think everyone's like so much, we have to have like the specific programming, yeah, you know, and it constrains learning. Yeah, exactly. A lot of this comes down to learning, right? Exactly. Like if we're stuck in one way and with what literature says, like this is how you squat or you have a lot of people out there who are professionals saying, hey, this is how you do a squat, this is how you do a bench press, all of that. It's like, okay, that works for you. 
Mm -hmm. But that may not work for me because, like, they might have shorter arms. I have abnormally long arms. That might not work for you. <laughs> right. Like, these, you got to find what works for you, and you may have to do a lot more exploration mm -hmm. or variability seeking or wayfinding for that. Mm -hmm. And and I, I think there's a there's a good article you you sent me before this called wayfinding. Yeah, wayfinding. I actually have it pulled up here. It's wayfinding how ecological perspectives of navigating dynamic environments can enrich our understanding of the learner and the proce learning process in sport. And I think I think learning is like the crux of this, yeah, right? Exactly. Like it's, it's how does the athlete learn how to do the motions and ultimately become not necessarily self-sustaining but more effective as a result long-term mm -hmm. and they can navigate their environments better, exactly. right? Exactly. And like you pointed out that learning shows up a lot and that these concepts are developing a better, more dynamic anti-fragile learner individual because if we're normally coaches are telling you this is how to move this is that that shuts the brain off but if we allow them to do a little more problem solving or navigating or wayfinding that actually stimulates the brain which mm -hmm. works in neuroplasticity which mm -hmm. we know that as we age that kind of goes away nope. and usually uh, Alzheimer's dementia usually pops up when we don't have that neuroplasticity. Dude, I, I love yeah. that point. I yeah. say that all the time yeah. to my clients. <laughs> yeah, it, so like, and I've, I've had a lot of clients or individuals tell me like, what am I supposed to do? I was like, well, I gave you this task. I don't care what, I usually I don't say I don't care, but I was like, it's up to you to find the solution for this problem. And whether that be targeting a certain muscle to feel or like going from point A to point B or jumping over something like mm -hmm. there's many different ways that we can do that and it's not uniform mm -hmm. and what and the reason why this all has this concept has answered that question in the beginning of what makes transfer training more efficient is because life and sport is chaotic and very even if you try to regulate yeah, it yeah you you can't regulate it because it's unpredictable mm -hmm. and so if we make training predictable and uniform and expect it to be highly transferable i feel like that's just insane and insane thinking i may be ruffling some feathers from that but like <laughs> I, a, I don't disagree a, a lot a lot of these th methods that we've seen in literature is like obviously it's worked but if you take it a step further, you got to look at the environment there. And a lot of Russian scientists, they had control over every single aspect of that individual's life from eating, sleep, all of that. And they monitored that. Well, we don't live in that era anymore where we can control. We get eight hours of sleep. You get this much calories, all of that. Mm -hmm. We don't live in that. We're very malleable and we dynamic we're, creatures, yeah, very dynamic creatures. We're not test subjects. We're not robots. And so this really plays into like training and being more non-linear mm -hmm. in training. And I've adopted that non-linear periodization type training into my training all the time. It forces you to be more of a coach than like a, just a program deliverer. Yes. Right. And I yes. think that scares a lot of coaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you know? for sure. Like I was, when I was interning, I was a deliverer. Like, Hey, this is how you do it. Boom, this is what the program says. This is how you move. This is what the coach is telling you to do, all of that. But then as I've gone through my experiences when I have met the people that I've met and have the mentors now, like they've challenged me, I've challenged them, and I'm just like, that makes sense. Like I've had that light bulb moment. It's just like that that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Like it sport is chaotic. It looks this way. We can take that implement into training and we can still obviously control it in here and be able to give snippets of it. For me, I do kind of just like a dive into it, but we can have it much more transferable from training to sport or to life or whatever. You're and training. it probably helps people understand like auto regulation yes. better in their own sessions and in the context of life, right? Because mm -hmm. yeah. they've actually learned how to handle and like, your, you know, your volume and your intensity and everything else exactly. too, right? Like do this pattern, but maybe this pattern doesn't feel great today because you just sat in the car for eight hours. Yeah. So we need to adjust your warm up a little bit or your warm up sets or your stance or something like mm -hmm. that, right? Yeah. You're more adaptable. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And that's, that's a good point too. Cause like from day to day or even from within a day, 
you might wake up feeling amazing. I slept great. I ate a great breakfast. I had this, I had that, I had my coffee, whatever factors that play into that. Mm -hmm. You go to your basic nine to five job, you might be sitting all day, you go to train as like, I feel like complete garbage. I can't do this today. Okay, we can adapt. We can still switch the plan and stuff. I've done that with a lot of athletes and individuals where it's, Hey, I'm not feeling great. Okay, switch the plan. That We're still on track. doesn't matter. We'll switch it. Right. Yeah. And this brings up a lot of questions and, and thoughts on, like, how do you now apply this? Like, how, how do you coach someone to get to that point? Especially especially online, because I need a lot of online coaching. Yeah, so it's – the online coaching aspect of it really was different because mm-hmm. I'm not in person doing it. But now a lot of my individuals, uh, like, they get it. Like, I – teach them the tools and teach them how to like auto-regulate weights because I don't program in percentages. I program in RPEs and RIRs, reps and reserve from that aspect because that teaches them how to feel it because I'm not there. I'm like, okay, 80%, boom, no, all that. I kind of throw that out the window. But how I usually introduce it is either within a warm-up, like you do a warm-up and it's like you have a set of 20 on a certain, like a lunge. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, Each one of those reps needs to be different in some way, shape, or form. Angle, tempo, whatever, eye positioning, all of that. And then you go into a normal training session, like do your normal thing. Or you could do the full training session. I've used it religiously within a 1x20 method where it's like 1x20 early on for four weeks. Every single rep needs to be different in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. Whether that tempo, eye positioning, stance, grip, whatever that is. And... Like that. Over time, they're going to, um, I tell them, obviously, it's going to be different, but I want you to explore, get out of this norm of what you've seen and heard, all of that, and I guarantee that it's going to make you more robust and healthier human, mm-hmm. all of that. I like that. And I'll touch on the robustness. You mentioned that in our first chat. Yeah. Robustness is one of my favorite new words to use for people. <laughs> Because I initially, he, when, he, when he talked about this, he said, I said, oh, it's so like resiliency. He said, no, not resilient. Oh, I know exactly. So robust. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Robust, I use it as you're a strong, healthy individual. I think what you're talking about is like anti-fragile. Right. Yes. Right. So resilient. And if you don't know what anti-fragile is, I recommend read the book Anti-Fragile by, <laughs> by Nassim Taleb. It doesn't get much easier than that. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't get easier than that. Uh, no, the book is a very, very good book. Nassim Taleb is a, is a great author, but basically saying, if you look at resiliency, a lot of people say, oh, we want to be resilient. Well, you come back from adversity, but you're the same individual. Mm-hmm. Anti-fragility is you get knocked down, you come back from any type of adversity, but you're a better individual after that. Mm-hmm. That plays into all of this that we've been talking about is because if I tell you, okay, you're train you the way you are, I add all this variability and stuff like that, you're going to become a better, more robust human individual mm-hmm. after, let's say, four to six weeks, whatever, on uh, type of training method. And you're going to be healthier, all of that. So all instead of a lot of these training modalities, it's like, oh, stronger, faster, but you're not robust, you're not healthy. You're going to just kind of two steps forward, one step back. All, so yeah. robustness is like you can give it a little bit. Yeah, you can. And you, and you continue to improve versus like just being like this stagnant being yeah, that's just exactly. taking hits, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think a lot of people, especially, you know, especially people like bodybuilders, are so in one way strong, but not in other ways. Yes, exactly. and they would be better bodybuilders if they did things like this. Right? Yeah. When's the last time a lot of bodybuilders did like a single leg squat? Yeah. You know how many times you do a single leg motion a day? It's literally how you walk. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah, so. we spend literally about like I don't know the statistic, but it's more than ninety percent of the time on one leg. Right. It's because we're walking, we're doing stuff. You mm-hmm. might have to hinge over and stuff like that. And, and like, I haven't been around bodybuilders enough, but I've been around power lifters enough mm-hmm. to know that their gait pattern, their movement patterns are so robotic and so blocky. And applying these methods can open up certain degrees of freedom, certain mobility restrictions, mm-hmm. and still achieve the same outcomes. I've applied this with one bodybuilder in particular, and it's usually like, it's usually they've like a west side conjugate method and stuff like that, but they're like so sagittal, linear, vertical. Mm-hmm. And when I've applied that, but 
had them get out of the norm. They're healthier. They can train longer. Their longevity goes up and still hit PRs. And still hit PRs, right. Yeah. Like how many, you know, and I made a post about this the other day, but like how many sets do you really need of one specific movement pattern, especially if it's a high RPE, Yeah. right? First off, and maybe one to two sets. If you're diversifying the movements, I think you're getting more out of your session because you're not just pounding the same one over and over and over. Exactly. I guess that's the point I'm getting at, yeah. right? So when you do, to your point, when you look at that, it's that neuroplasticity thing, mm -hmm. if, like concept or uh, it's a concept. It's, it's true. Um, if you just do the same thing over and over, you get numb to it. Your brain gets... Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I've done this before. Like, and what do normally people do when they're like, they accommodate for that? Is like increase the weight, increase the reps, still keep doing that. The body is not meant for uniform motion. All the tissues in the body are not meant for uniform motion. They look like they're very linear if you look at it from a microscopic standpoint. But you know, like your but, leg, the muscles yeah, circulate right. They circulate like, around. There's fascial tissue. There's spirals. Mm -hmm. There's all of this stuff, and our we're dynamic individuals or organisms and we respond to many different things and going back to that concept of like we perceive stress in many different things er or many different ways everything is stress mm -hmm. from that standpoint and so when, yeah. when, when, when you're talking about you know we're talking about hitting different patterns in the same workout right yeah. like you know and i think a lot of people kind of inherently somewhat start to do that but they don't expand on as much as they should like we're talking mm -hmm. about right and when I'm, when I'm thinking about a traditional program, they would say, okay, well, maybe you're not getting enough sets in an individual session to like learn the motion, mm -hmm. right? And that breaks down to maybe like this more like blocked practice, mm -hmm. right? Versus yep. um, uh, like, a, like a long continuous practice, like five sets of the same thing, right? You've, yep. you've beat that pattern down. You've got the stimulus you're going to get out of it yep. neurologically and physically, yeah. right? So you're saying instead maybe do, would you could do like the same variations each week and have a lot of them or like how would you play around with that to at least accomplish some sort of like a learning progress tracking method because i know a lot of people are gonna yeah. say it's something on yeah, that. yeah exactly um so what i've done is usually i've i've done a spectrum of like variability or degrees of freedom and mm -hmm. it's you can go from very decontextualized or robotic to very ever flowing and free flowing right. or organic and you can play around with that spectrum based off of like your individual that you're working with. I've done it with collegiate athletes at the uh, volleyball in particular, which I had the most success with because I had, I did this with, and I started them off with, okay, I want you to do a one by 20 method. I, that's what I did with them. Mm -hmm. And I told them, I want you to pick one variation that you want to try out or perform and do that for 20 reps. Mm -hmm. Then the next session, pick a different variation that you did last time, do that, and slowly compound each movement, each session on top of one another, and they're going to have, I don't like saying it's a library of movements, because that's just not how our brains work, it's not a computer system and memorizes it like that, but like they they inherently get better and better after each little compound mm -hmm. like this one percent better mentality kind of thing it, it, they're, they're learning like they've been in this position yeah. so their body is exactly adapting to it and, versus yeah. memorizing it exactly right? and that's and that's how our bodies adapt is whatever is placed upon us it's the said principle like mm -hmm. all that um which i think is an important concept in all of this too yeah, right exactly we are going to adapt to these different forces that are played upon it and the results that I got from all of this, I there were times near the end I told them, okay, like explore five, which I had a scale that I usually use. Explore five is every single rep needs to be different in that one by 20 method. Mm -hmm. And you see these girls who are six four, six five, and they're squatting ass to grass. They're doing split squat. They might be doing a skater squat with a bar on their back. They're doing all these different motions mm -hmm. and variabilities of movements. And that's what feels comfortable for them. And it, per I saw the difference on the court when they played. The confidence up, decision making was up. They're healthy. Or you have all this information processing while you're on playing right. and stuff. So it goes from individual to individual. But as they grow and as they become a better learner and individual of that sense, then that's when I kind of expand and let them 
throw the playbook out and just let them run with it a little bit sometimes. No, that's very interesting. So it can be specificity related to their, their individual experience. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they're a different position on the field, yep. whatever. So they need a different practice context yep. to learn how to explore. Um, but also in the context of something, you know, like bodybuilding or powerlifting, right? Like what movement are you trying to bring yeah, up, exactly. right? And, 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 or what injuries do you have? Yeah, exactly. And working around those constraints to and be you, more specific with it to create a certain outcome, right? Yeah, and you can... And I'm not saying, like, as the athlete or individual progresses from, like, a very beginner learner to an advanced learner and whatnot, or more robust, anti-fragile learner, all of that, I, you obviously have to throw in tougher tasks at them because that we're not going to, it's, you got to give them a little poke at, like, this is what's difficult for you and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So you get to play around with that as the coach and give them that stimulus of, like, hey, let's say... We're going to do a Zercher skater squat today. Oh, I've never done that before. It's going to be hard. If they go down just a little bit, that's fine. They accomplished that task. They got exposed to that stimulus. Then we may come back around and they might organically be like, hey, I want to challenge that a little bit further. And they might get better at it. If you give go back to like, hey, I want you to try a variation today of a knee dominant movement or a squatting movement. Oh, can I do a Zercher skater squat? That's I want to get better at that. Okay unilateral strength all of that stuff and they might gravitate towards that so if you give them exposures of something that's very difficult or just tough for them they might just gravitate towards it and want to obviously get better at it so, so specificity is i mean that's like the underlying principle of really all things training at the same time you can't lock things in the boxes yes you know, and I think that's what so many, like, this is a bodybuilding program. Yes. Well, what, what's going to grow muscle is also going to make it stronger. It's going to help improve mobility, right? Like joint resiliency. Yeah. So, and, and I think just be, that's what we're talking about becoming more a more robust human is yes. when you can incorporate different movements versus just trying to blacklist certain motions for yeah, different types yeah. of athletes. Yeah. You're better overall human, right? Yeah. And I mean, that's just how things work in today's era. It's like you go to somebody who's known for coaching bodybuilders athletes and doing it their way they do it uh like like you said this is a bodybuilding program this is a powerlifting <laughs> program it's like okay then what would happen most likely is someone gets injured or something like that mm. they didn't like it they were trying to fit a square peg in a round hole that doesn't work i look at more as like plato for example, like mm -hmm. uh, in our conversation, it's like it's malleable to whatever stress is there and they are able to form in different shapes. Like you have a ball of Play-Doh, you poke a hole in it, it's staying right there. It's like that's what you got to look at as programming in general and as the human. We're not glass. You, yeah, no, you, we're, you we're glass not glass hard enough is going to break, right? Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you take a hammer to glass, it's going to shatter, obviously. But if you take a hammer to Play-Doh, it's going to form but it's going to stay that form and you can <laughs> love that yeah and you can yeah. literally come back and shape it back you can't take glass and you i mean you certainly can try taking all those shards and put it back together but it's not going to be the same thing it it's won't be the same afterwards it, nope. and you're going to spend all the time too i think yeah. the thing is like if you're a bodybuilder and you get hurt mm -hmm. you can't you can't train no exactly. so no matter how perfect your bodybuilding program was but you got hurt taking the fucking trash to the curb yeah you're not going to be able to train. Exactly. You can't grow muscle. And right? I've done it where it's, we've had, af I've had athletes and individuals like, hey, I hurt my back or I hurt my shoulder. Okay, we're still training. Like, mm -hmm. we just have a constraint that we have to work right. with and we can work around it. Like, obviously with um, football, for example, like so I actually brought, brings it up one time when I was working with football athletes, they, guy came in, he separated his shoulder playing a game and he's like i can't train today and we're like yeah you're training today we talked with the eight athletic trainers like you're able to train you just can't do anything with this shoulder right okay we have safety bars that you can still squat with you can all of that you're still training that's just one aspect and when you train it's a global effect too it's not specific if it's like oh i'm working legs or arms or whatnot and this is obviously it's going to get weaker because you're not using it but if you stimulate the whole organism it's going to have there, a global and there's like that cross education yeah. effect too right yeah there's yeah all that and i think a lot of people when they get injured they they look at it as like uh i can't i can't train i had something the other day like their back their back hurt you know because they they were out too long doing something outside and they, they tweaked it right yeah. and, they, and they're like i can't train 
there's always a way to work around yeah, that. Exactly. And that's just a constraint. I, I love the perspective of, of putting things in perspective as affordances and constraints. Like, here's what you have available to you. Here's what the environment gives you. Here's what you can't do. Here's what, you know, the environment doesn't let you do. Yeah. And when you spin it all together, you create now what you can accomplish and you mm -hmm. find a way to make it happen, right? Exactly. And yeah. I think that's something people forget. It's like, there's going to be times in life, like my wife right now, is, you know, she's come off pregnancy. She can't do certain things, yeah. but she can still do other things. She's still learn how to navigate. She's short too. That's yeah. a whole another set of can of worms. Yeah. You know? So yeah, I, I really like that when in the context of like training around injuries too. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And, and auto-regulation, like you, you, you learn what you can and cannot handle exactly. with certain pains and motions and other things, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I really like that, man. So programming, you know, we've talked a lot about this. I like to always kind of wrap up with some like application type stuff. Um, and I know this is so so dynamic. But like, like where do you, so you, you start with like, you, need, you have these affordances, you know what they need to accomplish, right? Said principle, everything else. Um, how do you like to break down kind of like an average training week for somebody? Like, are you, you're not doing body part splits, right? Mm -hmm. You full body guy, upper lower guy, like just in general, like, is there any framework you like to use? Um, no. Dude, I know this is I, such a broad question. I, I and like, no. the, we'll do, we'll do future podcasts unless yeah. we break down different types of training too, but. Yeah, no, I don't, <laughs> I don't look at a per se, per se split or like schedule or whatnot because like in this non-linear thinking like you're exposed to like all of these different modalities and different qualities that we do um what i've naturally gravitated towards is i have a high or max effort like bilateral day and a unilateral day i've split it up into full body days to upper body, lower body days and stuff like that. I, especially with a one by 20 method. Like I, that's kind of like my heart and soul kind of method that I love to fall back on because there's a nations of, Oh, it's one by 20 you're working strength endurance. No. How about you go do one by 20 on a back squat? You're not just working strength endurance. You're working a lot of different qualities. Uh, that's a whole nother podcast and whatnot, but yeah. one by 20 is fucking brutal. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Especially in the way I program. It, right. It's not as simple as it sounds, right? <laughs> no, like, you no, just no. go through the motions. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, but um, what I've usually gravitated towards is using the conjugate method where you have a max effort, dynamic effort day, mm -hmm. and all that. And as some people know, like West Side's pro like made that so famous, and they come up with all these variations. That's kind of why I liked it, because you have these variations of barbell, equipment, all of that, and... It's law of accommodation. So that's kind of why I go towards a more dynamic effort day. I usually split it up into upper body, lower body days. But how I apply all of these is you can do variations from week to week, whether it's their max effort day is a lower body squat day. I have them do a heavy, uh, heavy as possible ISO lunge, 30 mm -hmm. seconds on each leg. Boom, that's your max effort day. Next week is the um, eccentric split squat or a whatever mm -hmm. variation you can do it that way but like how i usually have people do it is how i implement it right away is usually warm-ups and then i kind of just sprinkle it in throughout the training sessions and whatnot and if so and if you're warming up and let's say you have like an eight by five squat you know um when you're warming up you're not trying all the different variations in the warm-up or are you like I, how do you warm I'm, up to allow for that many variations without spending a ton of time I usually, what I do is have them do two to three sets of uh, warm-up sets going from light to moderate weight. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say eight by five, I usually do a set of uh, nine, set of seven, mm -hmm. and then going from light to moderate. And I tell them each rep in the warm-up sets needs to be a different way, shape, or form. And they get to choose. What I usually like to do is I allow the individual to choose, hey, what squat variation do you want to work on today? Oh, I want to do zercher squat. Okay. Let's do a zercher squat. The next week might be, I want to try front squat. There's another variation in that aspect as well. Mm -hmm. But from warm-ups, I tell them, okay, fine. Every rep needs to be different in some way, shape, or form. And it goes back to, like, what's our task? I want you to really get comfortable with a squatting movement. Okay, fine. Fine. Every rep needs to be different in some way, shape, or form until you find a position or variation that feels comfortable for you. For me, usually it's, I just want you to get strong in many different ways so usually it's like okay it's getting the brain warmed up mm -hmm. because we're learning and be like oh this is what feels good for me today um 
with these variations. Now you can strengthen those variations that might not feel great or feel great. And then eight sets of five, you got one variation. Okay, next set's a different variation. Next set's a different variation. And what also can play into the variation or adding these concepts is you can play around with different weights too. For the weights that, or for the variations that feel god awful, miserable, lighten the load. You're still getting strong. It's not, strength is not a percentage, it is not a number, it's an expression. Mm -hmm. And if you get strong, it's relative. Yeah, it's relative. And if you look at someone who can do a Zercher split squat, for example, it's like, obviously, you're not, if I've never done that before, you're not going to be strong in it. But if you try it and it feels heavy, that's why I program in RPs and reps in reserve. If it feels heavy, you're getting stronger. So, yeah. I, I, I really like that. So you're probably not, just because I know you guys probably like, oh, how the, like, there's all these variations. How do we <laughs> can, think about programming them at all, right? It's yeah. probably like, okay, well, you're doing a bar on your back, and now you're doing, like, some different stances, some different tempos or whatever, right? Yep. Um, I know technically it could be, like, a barbell back and then, like, a barbell front, like a searcher, but I, I think sometimes for some people, too, that might be, like, too much mm -hmm. changing of weights and everything else. And maybe it's, like, a whole different exercise yeah. or... You do a couple sets of like barbell back stuff, and then maybe you want to do a zercher, a few zercher variations. If you have mm -hmm. seven, eight by five, it's like a four by five and a four by five. Basically, it, it's infinitely yeah. programmable yeah, based exactly. on what you need to work on. Yeah. And I did this the other day. I did four sets of squats in my workout. I thought I'd plan for my quads, and I did a, a narrow stance, a wide stance, and then I did a, and they were top loaded, mm -hmm. and then I did them at the bottom load for uh, a pause, and then I did a fourth set of some Jefferson, which felt fucking awesome. My hips, ankles, knees have never felt better. Um, and I got a great stimulus too, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. why you need some good equipment and variable of equipment at some time too. But yeah. even like tempos and stances and plane changes can do so much, exactly. right? Exactly, yeah, for yeah. sure. It's, it's, like you said, it's infinitely programmable. What I usually tell people if, like, who are very cautious about this program, this type of implementation is start with the warm-up or start very small. Start with one variation. Mm-hmm. Or implement it into your warm-ups and then just go normal. And then if you're curious and want to try it more, just spoon feed it. I don't I'm not saying I'm I'm the crazy one here and I've kicked Sparta kicked people into the pit <laughs> and be like, okay, we're doing this, but I've learned and as a human, I've learned from my mistakes and whatnot. But like um usually with coaches I tell them just sprinkle it in a little bit, try it, and then expand upon that more. You're a learner yourself. And you know your limitations and you may, and if you want to become a more long, like robust human and live a longer life, obviously that's what we want to do. Mm -hmm. Like expand upon that. You have to, you have to do that. And I, and, and I, I, I think that's getting close to pretty much like wrapping up that concept before we start like deep diving, like how to program everything individually. But like that robust human thing, dude, like yeah. I cannot phrase how important i think that is to literally everybody because you're probably thinking right now like oh i'm not gonna do a jefferson squat that's not good for my quad or whatever you're thinking right but if you like literally step foot in the gym it's because you want to feel better in some way or look better in some way yeah and i don't know a single person a single type of goal who cannot benefit from that style of of thinking and programming yeah absolutely right and if you ever want to I can always program it for you and be like, hey, we're doing this. This yeah, is, right. I'll, kick, I'll, kick, I'll kick you in. Right, he'll kick you <laughs> yeah, in. Right? I'll kick you in, but yeah. Yeah, because you said you're working, uh, as a bit of a conclusion here, you said you're working with Future app, yep. right? Yeah, right. I'm, I'm working for a company called Future. Um, they are an online virtual personal training company, and the goal is to modernize personal training because, like, as we go into this new era of training because of COVID, like, we can train people virtually. I have clients from the East Coast, West Coast, Florida, Texas, all of that stuff mm -hmm. and whatnot. And it's a great company and it's we have tons and tons of coaches. We have about like 350 coaches on staff that have a plethora of experience from bodybuilding, from professional sports, collegiate sports, like fitness, prenatal, postnatal group fitness, all that, like you could, whatever you can think of as a coach for the fitness professional, we have a coach that specializes in that. Mm -hmm. And we're not, and the one thing that really sets us apart is we've developed this relationship with you and we program for you not, and it's not a, at a session cost, it's for a monthly subscription and you get 
as much programming as you want or able to within your life and within your schedule. I have clients that are like busy all the time and can only fit 20 minutes in a day or can only get three days a session. Okay, that's cool. We can adapt to that. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes future really cool. And, uh, um, I'm very thankful and grateful to have found them and it has allowed me to really expand upon these concepts with just the general public on this because I was in the silo of working with athletes. Now I can deliver this to the world, basically. Yeah, and I and I, I think we, we reference the term athlete a lot, but this does not apply to yeah. just athletes. In, in our minds, athlete kind of like literally anybody, <laughs> I, right? Like, cause yeah. you're in your environment, you're performing in your performer in your environment, right? I, yeah. So. And you made a good point of that. Uh, just to finish it off. Like I think everybody's an athlete. It, it doesn't matter if you're 50 years old. And if you want to go out and play a game of basketball, you're an athlete. If you want to go out and hike, you're an athlete. And you want to live life, so you need to be robust human. Yes. Right? Yeah, right. for sure. Cool. That was awesome, man. Yeah, if you guys have any questions or, you know, uh, want, you know, Sam on a future podcast, which we will absolutely do whether you want him or not, because I love talking <laughs> to this guy. Um, yeah, just drop some comments below. Uh, where can they find you and information about you in future? Uh, so if you go on to Instagram, that's what I usually use. It's at elsner.sam. Message me. I can get you a free month at future, usually. Um, just DM me, can send you that way so you can play around with the service or whatnot, or just go on future.com, future.fit, uh, and you'll, can get things rolling there and you can get through the whole process. Awesome. All right. That's, that's it on, uh, the, the concept of ecological dynamics and how to become a more robust human. Stay tuned for the, the next episode in our podcast. Talk to you now. All right, dude. Sweet. That was dope, dude. Yeah. I think that worked fucking great. I enjoyed that.